lecture series of the SOAS Middle East Institute this term. Uh, this evening's le lecture is co-hosted by my colleague, Dr. Yorgos Dedes, senior lecturer in Turkish, who is also the convener of my department, the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics, largest and most popular postgraduate program, the MA Middle Eastern Studies. And Yorgos himself is a very active member of Center for Ottoman Studies at SOAS and also teaches the Ottoman language. I also bring you the greetings of Professor Dina Matar, who uh, normally um, co-chairs this session, uh, but overwhelmed with so many other commitments. So uh, uh, we have my colleague Yorgos here tonight. Our distinguished guest tonight is Professor Mark David Bauer, Professor of International History at the London School of Economics and Political Science at uh, good old LSE. And for quite a while, or perhaps still, um, Professor Bauer will correct me, is the only professor in the United Kingdom that teaches Ottoman history in the entirety of that title. We can spend the whole session and then some more to just list Professor Bias' publications. But suffice to say that in the past 15 years alone, he has written extensively on the history of the Ottoman Empire, as well as Turks in Germany. And most recently, his highly acclaimed work entitled The Ottomans, Khans, Caesars, and Caliphs, which is published by Basic Books. And if I'm not mistaken, it was um, uh, uh, published at the end of 2021, in November 2021, which uh, we will be talking, um, discussing this evening. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the numerous articles that um, uh, 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 list his publications, and I refer you to his uh, webpage on the LSC uh, website. We're delighted that um, Professor Bayer has been able to accommodate, accom accommodate our invitation in his incredibly busy schedule. And um, uh, if I am allowed to rely on the Twitter source of information, I learned this afternoon that Professor Bayer is on his way after India, after uh, attending a literary festival in India to Lahore, Literature Festival next week to talk about his book. Our format tonight is just a little bit different to the usual series of just giving a lecture, but we have had uh, sessions when uh, we have a conversation with the author, and that is um, what we will do this evening. So as usual, do please type your questions in the Q&A uh, function and I will collate them and I will look at them and will uh, perhaps you know intercept the conversation between Dr. Dedes and Professor Barr uh, with some of your questions and we will leave plenty of time in the one hour session that we have tonight to address more of that. So if I may, if I am allowed um, uh, Professor Bar Mark, if I may, I was um, first. I thought I should quickly look at the GCSE syllabus um, uh, and to see whether you know where do the Ottomans feature in that. Whether the you know British students at that level engage with the topic, and it's really very selective. I have to say, I haven't looked at the entire thing, but it's the you know the obvious one, the much later you know the end of the um, you know, collapse of the empire or perhaps siege of Vienna. But it made me wonder that for a dynasty that for almost six centuries has ruled such a huge expanse of Asia, North Africa, big chunks of uh, uh, Europe, um, why, is, why is so little attention? And I say that advisedly, I haven't gone through every uh, part of the syllabus of uh, 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 looking at it. So I wanted to ask you first and foremost, is your book a, about the sort of place of Ottomans 
in the European political thought, or is it, you know, is it an encounter between Europeans and Ottomans? Would I be able to describe it as that? Thank you for having me on the at your uh, at so at SOAS tonight. Um, it's it's too bad that we can't um, do this in person, but here we are. We reach more people, perhaps. And I also my my own children were just selecting their GCSE um, subjects, and uh, I can tell you that for year ten, where they're going to go to school, um, the the Ottomans don't figure. Um, it is uh, it is it is it is how it, it is in many places. I am working with a secondary school system uh, elsewhere in England, uh, outside of London, and I am helping them um, develop a, a unit on the Ottomans to put into their curriculum. It won't be year, uh, I'm not quite sure, it might be year seven, but the year doesn't matter. So, and, and as we are writing it together, of course, you realize how many stereotypes about Muslims, about Turks, about Ottomans there are. And so hopefully reaching out to secondary students, um, it'll help to change that. So the book doesn't do what you say. Um, what, it's not about Europeans and Ottomans. One aspect of the book is to make the show how the Ottomans were European. And the Ottomans, of course, were an Afro-Asiatic European empire and other scholars, colleagues of my own are more focused on South Asia. And, and there have been some recently, there have been some really good books about the Ottomans and the Mughals, and that's important. My interests living here, living in post-Brexit England, I'm a new arrival to England, I've been here about 10 years, but living here in the Brexit times, I think I was influenced. And one of the things that I do focus on in the book is how European the Ottomans are. And so the book is not about how Europeans view the Ottomans, but it's about stretching the canvas of Europe, stretching out from London to Baghdad, and including Muslims and Jews in the story that we tell about the past here in Britain, and also for readers in Turkey. And I've gotten very good feedback. Um, there have been a number actually of Turkish ambassadors, uh, not prompted by me, who are tweeting aspects of the book where I show just how European the Ottomans are. And I could give lots of examples of that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Mark, if I may step in now. And I think um, it would be fair to say that um, we're all, in a sense, um, basking in your reflected glory and the glory of a distinguished colleague for doing exactly what you've just said, making it clear that um, with a book that is um, public-faced, um, um, open to a general public, you have made it um, uh, a, po a particular point to stress how the Ottomans fit as part of what should be a new re redefinition of what Europe is. It is not about the um, contacts and how they have been um, um, part of the imagination of Europe in mostly in an inimical way as the enemy, not to mention um, uh, the sort of abysmal depths of, 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 of um, negative propaganda that were reached in the 19th century with, with um, expressions, the more famous expressions of the likes of, 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 of Tsar Nicholas as the sick man of Europe or even the, um, um, the unspeakable Turk and things like that. But, your book very much tries to show that that uh, just like Muslim Spain um, before them at the other end of Europe, um, the Ottomans when they occupied the southeastern uh, space of strictly speaking geographical Europe were very much um, not just on on that score, but because they were part of developments that affected everyone. Um, um, uh, an object of study that should be undertaken in parallel. And um, it is, um, it's been a good, a good almost 20 years since um, a last book of that kind, which was not even of that kind, um, uh, or the last two books of a similar kind that were published in the early 2000s, Colin Imber's more specialist sort of a book about the early and classical Ottoman Empire, the structure of power, as he called it, which was aimed at redressing 
some key misunderstandings about the Ottomans and setting the early chronology right. And then of course, um, Caroline Finkel's very impressive and all encompassing comprehensive book about the history of the Ottoman Empire, which was of course precisely that, and a, a, a general a history that covered all aspects and or, which is not what of course your book is trying to do. And um, your book has a particular, so to speak, ax to grind, but in the best possible way of, of showing the way the Ottomans can help um, the general public, public intellectuals, and of course, scholars to rethink some of their conceptions and preconceptions about Europe and so on. Um, and from that point of view, um, it is it has been a remarkable achievement. And if I'm not mistaken, this was um, when you mentioned your involvement with secondary schools, which I think came as a result of your book. But um, I, uh, you mentioned in another occasion that you know, um, for what it's worth, the European Parliament sort of um, took notice as well. So it is having exactly the sort of impact. Um, and I use the word not in the sort of dirty sense that it might just have in the in, in, in the strictly speaking academic circles, but the right sort of impact of pricking up people's ears about the Ottomans. Um, so um, perhaps it would be fair to start by um, you telling us a little bit more about, of course, the title and the allusion of the title to the three different sort of backgrounds of the Ottomans, the Turkic, the Islamic. Um, so the Turkic alluding a little bit to their title as Hans, the Islamic in as much as they were, of course, it's at some stage, especially when they were now, they became a power in the Middle East. They assumed the title of Caliph um, in, in the 16th century with Suleiman the Magnificent as, as, as your book argues convincingly rather than Selim the Grim, Selim the First. Um, and of course, the third title, Caesars, um, which refers with its connotations to, to um, the Byzantine, the Roman um, uh, background of, of um, the Ottomans, who, as nomadic Turks, who adopted Islam from the Persians, came and settled and ruled in an area that was primarily um, what we now call the Eastern Roman Empire, but an empire that very much thought of itself as the Roman Empire, Byzantium, and, and um, the Ottomans saw very much themselves as successors to that. So tell us a little bit more, if you don't mind, a little bit about your choice of the three um, um, titles of the Ottomans as an appropriate title for a book on the Ottoman dynasty. That's right. I was asked to write a, a history of the dynasty, not a history of, of every event, and every battle, and every corner of the empire. So that's how the book differs from Caroline Finkel's masterwork. But it very much is modeled on her, on her work, which came out about 15, 16, 17 years ago. And of course, Caroline is, a, is an alum from, from SOAS. SOAS, of course, is very proud of her. From Colin Imber's book, I took the idea that one should translate Ottoman terms into English. We, as Ottoman specialists, we forget that our reading public doesn't know Ottoman Turkish. So, so that's what I took from, from Colin's book. But his book ends in 1650. And so, so I was asked to write a history of the dynasty from the whole time period. And of course, when you write a book of this length, um, I think um, on audiobooks, it takes 18 hours to listen to it. Uh, don't, don't do that. Uh, that's too long of your time. But um, I, of course, when you write a book of this length, you have to have an argument. You have to have a theme. And I began to think about how I would present the Ottomans. And the Ottomans, I, if we go back to Osman, the very the progenitor of the dynasty, um, he didn't know what would come after him. But I think of him, and we have to think of him and think of all the inheritances that he is inheriting, everything that he's drawing upon. So he is a Turkic chieftain. He's not even a Sultan. He is a semi-nomadic warrior at the end of the 1290s, and he's raiding. He's raiding in Northwestern Anatolia in the Byzantine Empire. He's also raiding, going on armed confrontations against other Muslim Turkic uh, chieftains in the area. And he's surrounding himself, not only with fellow Turkic Muslim people, but also with, with Greeks. And his right-hand man, 
for, for a decade and a half, is a Greek who, um, who remains a Christian for about 15 years before he converts to Islam. But most of Osman's retainers are Christians. So this made me think about how the Ottomans drew upon the Byzantine past and their present, also their Turkic Mongol past, and also Islam. And when we think about the Islam of the Ottomans, this is a, this is an, they have different interpretations over the centuries. There are different emphases. The dynasty, the members are surrounding themselves with different types of Muslims. So, so I wanted to reflect that diversity in the book. But already from the earliest times, certainly from uh, Osman and his son Orhan's time, the Ottomans begin to intermarry with Christian dynasties, European dynasties, with the Byzantines. They begin to intermarry with Serbian dynasty. They begin to play a role in the Byzantine civil war. They send their, their mystics, their Sufis, to Constantinople, to the palace, where the Christians complain about their, their wild um, chanting and, and, and so on. So we have to think about the Ottomans, not in black and white terms, but as, a, as an Asian and as a European Islamic power that is incorporating Christian elements and most of the time allowing Christians to remain Christian. And there are many examples as we move forward into the centuries, aspects of our own past that we forget about. There is going to be an election in, in France in April, and no one's talking about how in the 16th century, the Ottomans and the French king launched naval campaigns against the Italian city-states. That's not the tenor of the French election campaign right now in, in the way they talk about Muslims. So these aspects of the European past are forgotten, buried, silenced. And so that's why I emphasize them in this book from the earliest days all the way until, as, as Yorgo mentioned, the Russian Tsar called the Ottomans the sick man, the Sultan, the sick man of Europe. But in the book, I focused on the second part of that phrase, of Europe. And his reflection in the 19th century that there were parts of Europe, which was incorporated diplomatically speaking after the Crimean War in the middle of the 19th century, this was a reality already from the 1300s where the earliest diplomatic relations, excuse me, <clears throat> between the Ottomans and the French, again, for example, goes back to the 14th century when the French had to ransom knights that were captured by the Ottomans during a crusade. So, so this is the point. But the other point is also, excuse me, to rethink different conceptions we have about history, not to fit Muslims in, not to say, okay, Europeans have established all the, the different patterns of history and Europeans have defined the different stages of history. And, and as a historian of the majority Islamic world, I'm just gonna fit them into that. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, by showing, for example, how much of a Renaissance prince, Mehmed II, the one who conquered Constantinople and his successor, Bayezid II were, I'm trying to expand our understanding of what Renaissance means. So, so not just talking about encounters, but when we talk about when the same portrait painter was hired in Venice and then was hired in Istanbul, then we're talking about a, a shared Renaissance culture. Absolutely, yes, and, and, and that ties in with, with um, the title of Caesar and Kaiser, um, which as, as in, in the um, popular form of Kaisari Rum, the Caesar of Rum, the Caesar of Rome, perhaps in, in translation, um, um, would refer in, in, in the popular epics about to the, would refer to the um, Christian rulers, um, um, but then eventually gets to be adopted um, as a title by um, Mehmet the Conqueror, um, who is exactly a kind of Renaissance man with his interests um, in, in both Italy and, and the pre-Islamic um, uh, past of the area with his dabbling in, into Greek and so on and commanding, um, commissioning rather, manuscripts um, in, in, in both Greek and Hebrew and other sources and sowing his sort of um, um, attitude uh, to learning. That is, um, you could argue um, in some ways, typically Islamic um, in the way that um, one could argue that Islam in a sense never went through um, uh, 
a medieval period of dark ages because it kept in many ways the old legacy of, of late antiquity, um, philosophical and otherwise through um, the translations into Arabic and then the use um, of those works, not just in, by the Arabs, but in Persian as well. A lot of the translations were done by all kinds of different people and that tradition continued. So in many ways, for me, um, what your book nicely highlights um, is the way in which this sort of um, um, platonic almost understanding or neoplatonic as we might call it now, um, which you exemplify in the figure of Ibn Arabi, um, one of the hardest uh, possibly um, thinkers to understand, but an incredibly influential one, which interesting comes from Spain to um, the Middle East and Anatolia itself, um, whose thought um, via his disciples and so on permeated Ottoman um, centers of learning, the famous madrasas, the religious schools, but also a lot of, of, of the thinking of the um, Sufi orders, as we would call them. Um, so much so that you could argue that, that in many ways, um, members of the Ottoman dynasty is very well educated in the classical way, princes, but also, of course, um, the, um, the elite of the Ottoman court um, took this Ibn Arabi tradition, took this tradition of a combination of beauty and love of, of um, being in a position to appreciate um, the beauty as it crystallized, of course, in adolescent boys more than anything else. Um, sometimes we, um, we, we, we speak of young boys, which would be a little bit unfair to, to, to give the impression that they were really boys. We're talking here about teenage adolescents being idolized for their beauty. A staple, a staple picture, of course, and symbol in Persian literature, which is there in, 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 Turkish, in Turkish and Ottoman literature as well. And, and in some ways comes to be an emotional script for life. Um, for the for the Ottoman elite um, uh, who are given the uh, who have the luxury, if you like, of applying it, given that they live in an empire which, because of its military success, has the possibility of exactly promoting the arts, um, the finer arts. So, um, um, next to um, this. Um, leitmotif theme of, of the empire being an empire of conversion that I would like to, to come um, uh, to next. May I ask you first um, to comment yourself on the importance of this Sufi um, string, which of course, as you rightly um, um, stress, is not only of the elite, um, so to speak, uh, persuasion, but, but, but um, has a very strong manifestation throughout the Ottoman period with the wandering type of dervish, the calendar, the, the deviant dervishes, which are antinomian, they focus on faith um, and not rituals, and, and therefore have a possibly destabilizing role, but also a galvanizing role. So for me, one of the very successful aspects of your book is, is, is to see, to trace the continuity of the presence of both types of Sufism in, 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 in the empire and within the dynasty itself. So um, I wonder if you could say a few, um, how you visualize that um, um, in the writing of the book. The, the example that you gave of, of staring at young boys and relationships with, with youth and the idealization of youthful beauty is something, again, this illustrates how the Ottomans were, all of these different things, they're Asian and they're um, European because they're taking this both from Islamic culture, and in this case, they're taking it from the culture of Rumi, the great, the great mystic. They're also taking it from Renaissance culture. And this Renaissance culture, maybe it comes later in Europe than it, the rest of Europe than it does in the Ottoman Empire. This is also shows how what was happening here in London was similar to what was happening in Florence, which was similar to what was happening in Istanbul. So that's, that's one aspect. And, um, but Sufism is extremely important for the empire. And as I mentioned, there's different competing versions of Islam that are going to bubble and surface and, and, and come in, in different ways. Now, so 
going back to Osman, the very first the progenitor. Now he surrounds himself with a variety of Muslims and some of these Muslims beliefs and practices would not be accepted by today's Muslims as being uh, proper and as being Islamic in any way. Um, and so that's why in the book, I call them deviant dervishes in the sense that, as you mentioned, these were people who they consume um, narcotic, narcotic substances, they chewed um, uh, marijuana, basically. They also, they um, drank alcohol, they consumed alcohol. They also tattooed their body, they pierced, pierced their body. Sometimes they went around with no clothes or only with bear skins or whatever kind of animals they could find. There's a famous, there's a mosque in Bursa. Um, and this is the mosque of Geekli Baba, Geekli Dede. So this is the, the, the Sufi who, who pranced around with deer. And, and if you go to that, that um, his tomb, then you have uh, a lot of antlers are there still today. So you have these kind of Sufis and the Ottomans are close to them for the first at least three and a half centuries. They're close to this type of Sufi. They want their blessings. They want their baraka, And they're, they're close to the, the dynasty. But of course, there are other kinds of Muslims, mostly coming from what is today Iran. And these are Sunni uh, Muslims whose beliefs and practices would be very uh, understandable for Muslims in London today. So already from the beginning, it seems that Osman had these two types of Muslims in his retinue, surrounded himself by them. Now, these Sufis I mentioned, these, these deviant dervishes, on the one hand, they wanted them around for their blessings. But the problem was that these dervishes could give their blessing to someone else. And that's why in the book, I try to depict the Ottoman dynasty as being quite fragile, because especially in the early centuries, some of these uh, deviant dervishes could raise armies, could proclaim uh, using, as you mentioned, Ibn Arabi's concept of the pole of the universe, the one person who is lit upon whom literally the whole the world revolves, some of these individuals claimed that they were the pole of the universe. And because of that, they were the ones who were owed uh, obedience, not the Sultan, who was just an ordinary man. So that's why we see, especially in the 16th century, we see uprisings, tens of thousands perhaps of armed Sufis uh, taking over provinces of the empire, threatening the Sultan, moving throughout the centuries. There were constantly, there were assassination attempts, attempts on the Sultan. And so over time, we see very different kinds of religiosity and different kinds of Islam uh, proclaimed by the Sultan, depending on who, who it is. So I mentioned Osman and uh, some of the crazy characters in his retinue that would be continued for a while. Or if we think about someone such as Suleiman in the middle of the 16th century would be the first Sultan who called himself Caliph. So Caliph, of course, is the symbolic leader of all world Sunni Muslims. So this is very different. Now, earlier in his reign, we know from reading the, the material that was produced uh, at his court, Suleiman actually had very radical views. And there were people in his court who thought Suleiman was a messianic figure, not just the Mahdi, not just the redeemer, but something even, even more powerful than that, the one ru world ruler who would unite East and West. So this, this Islamic uh, thought and influence plays into the European aspect when Suleiman, who believes probably, it seems from the written sources, that he was indeed the ruler to come at the end of time, that then he had a Venetian goldsmith create for him a four-tiered crown, three of, three of uh, which, now, Charles V had three tiers. I'm sorry, I meant to say Suleiman's is a four-tiered, maybe I said four. Charles V's, the Holy Roman Emperor's crown is three-tiered. Suleiman had the goldsmith add a papal tiara to it. So the crown looks like the Holy Roman Emperor's crown plus the Pope's crown. And this is what Suleiman actually wore in Sarah, he put on his, on his head in ceremonies as he paraded through Belgrade under Roman ceremonial arches. So, so here again, we see how the Islamic is moving together uh, with the European and creating something unique and something that both um, um, startled but also made other Europeans wonder about. Hmm. I mean, wonder in the sense of they were, they were impressed. Our own Henry VIII liked to wear Ottoman dress. He was so jealous that this other power was so wealthy and had such sumptuous materials. 
thank you. There the, the, the are different ways um, um, in which to continue from here, but um, um, I would like to pick up the strand of the, of the, of the, of the messianic movements and, and, and the Sufi um, turmoil that you mentioned um, to move on to, of course, the Jewish messianic um, about a century later, the Sabbatai Tzvi um, um, incident or chapter, which is um, a fascinating chapter of Ottoman history, which again, via the Jewish Muslim um, um, uh, connection brings um, uh, um, the European aspect as well into the foreground, given the communications that, that um, existed at the time and the correspondence between uh, Jews in different um, cities in, 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 in Europe and in the Ottoman Empire, and, and um, invite you to, to sort of comment a little bit about the importance of, of um, um, as you were saying at the beginning, not only Muslim, um, Muslims in Europe, but, but Jews with their connections across um, different borders in Europe in the case of um, Sabbatai Tzvi. That's right. And this is also another way to look at how our history is told. So the, the, the great biography and biographical history we have of Shabtai Tzvi was written by a great scholar uh, by the name of Gershom Sholem, who, if you read the book, you would never imagine that it took place in the Ottoman Empire. Um, it's also, it's almost barely even mentioned that, that Shabbatai Tzvi uh, was, uh, comes from Izmir, the city some people call Smyrna. So this was it in the 1660s, 1666. This was uh, a, a, the second greatest Jewish messianic movement in history after that of Jesus. And what is significant in many ways is there have been many Jewish messianic movements in history, but usually they end up in very grim ways. The, the messianic figure is, is executed. This happened, there was a Kurdish Jewish messianic figure who was executed in, in, in earlier centuries. But in this case, what's interesting is that the Sultan Mehmed IV calls Shabbatai Tzvi to the palace for an interview and asks him to renounce all of the, uh, in the Ottoman text, all the nonsense that was told about him being the Messiah. Now in the Ottoman text, they actually say about being a prophet, but what we understand it, the claim of Shabbatai Tzvi was that he was a Messiah. So Shabbatai Tzvi denies everything according to the Ottoman source, and then he converts to Islam. So usually such figures and thousands of Jews were causing all kinds of chaos in the empire because they were saying that this figure was going to remove the, well, was gonna dethrone the Sultan and, and rule in his place. So despite all the upheaval, now that his followers weren't armed, but despite all this, the Sultan took Shabbat Tzvi as an usher into his palace as a Muslim. Now. This is, uh, this is intriguing. He wasn't executed for his blasphemous thoughts. He was taken into the palace. And we know from his own letters that he penned that he didn't really become a Muslim. In other words, and he told his followers, hundreds of them also converted to Islam ostensibly, but secretly they maintained a secret faith. It was not Judaism. It was not Islam. It was a new religion only for that group at which Shabbat Tzvi was the Messiah. They believed in things that went against Judaism and went against Islam. So Shabbat Tzvi is not executed. He's exiled. His followers coalesce in Salonika, which is a great city today. And it was a great Ottoman city before it, it fell to Greece in 1913. And from there, this group of his descendants would arise again. And his, his descendants, the descendants of those people who converted along with Shabbat Tzvi would reappear in the 19th century and play an important historical role. And um, his case, of course, with the conversion um, opens up this other very important aspect of your book, which is the way in which the empire was an empire of conversion, one of its strengths, oh, one of its cornerstones rather militarily, but also in many ways socially with the Janissaries who were the elite military core the result of um, conversion, but also the result of this so-called collection, um, that is the, the child levy, um, which wasn't necessarily, again, a levy of, of little children, but of, of, of um, young boys who were clearly um, at an age that it could be determined they would make sturdy and good soldiers in, in, to begin with, 
and possibly able administrators um, once trained um, as well. And your book traces this um, important theme, which is tied of, of conversion, which um, ties in with, with another extremely important theme of the book of tolerance, of Muslim tolerance, Ottoman tolerance, as you call it, which it is necessary for people to realize was taking place in the lands of Europe and therefore needs, one should no longer think of, 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 autumn, of um, European toleration and European tolerance without taking into account, again, both the Spanish example earlier and the Ottoman example later. But tolerance comes, um, 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 is at the behest rather of the ruler for all that it is guided by Islamic practices to a significant degree, um, the way it is applied and was applied at exactly at the time of um, Sabatai Tzvi's um, um, uh, movement in the um, uh, forced, if you like, um, expulsion of Jewish communities from the center of town, the expropriation um, of their areas for um, Islam and conversion to Islam is, are the two interesting faces of this coin of conversion um, on which um, so much of, of, of the application of tolerance um, um, uh, hinged. So um, I wonder if you could say a few words about that, please. That's right. So we have to think of a tolerance and conversion together. And a lot of people misunderstand this. So tolerance, by tolerance, I don't mean coexistence and equality. Of course, Islam was supreme according to the legal system of the Ottoman Empire. Just as men had more rights than women, Muslims had more rights and better rights than Christians and Jews. So Christians and Jews were tolerated. They were allowed to live. They were allowed to flourish. But there was a social hierarchy. So, but again, compared to, for example, the treatment of Jews in the rest of Europe at the time, this was, this was, something, this was something superior. It's not something we would want today. No one wants to be a second-class citizen. But it was what it was. And the Spanish Muslims, the Muslims in Spain uh, from the 8th century, and the Ottomans in Eastern Europe from the 14th century introduced tolerance to Europe. And so, as you mentioned, we, we shouldn't just be believe that people began to understand and, and figure out how to live along with each other only in the 18th century and age of enlightenment. No, Muslims introduced it to Europe earlier, but it's not part of the story we tell about European tolerance. So if we keep this in mind, that tolerance is an allowing to live and allowing to flourish, but it's at the behest, as you said, of the ruler, then we can also understand conversion. So over the centuries, Christians and Jews were allowed to remain Christian and Jewish. Jews forcibly converted to Catholicism in, in, by the Spanish and Portuguese, settled in the empire by the tens of thousands and returned to Judaism. So this, this, is, this is important to keep in mind. At the same time, there was a, as you mentioned, a levy. One out of every 40 Christian youth in Ottoman occupied territories were taken from their homes and were circumcised, converted, trained in the Islamic languages and were then, they were slaved, enslaved, they were able to rise in the military or the bureaucracy based on their, their skills, their merit. So, so these go together, these go together. And we can't just narrate Ottoman history, not talking about the collection, um, only talking about tolerance as some people want to do, but we can't just talk about the Ottomans and just talk about the, the levy of youth. It's the Ottomans on the whole allowed Christian Jews to thrive, but at the same time, in order to build their, their machine of state, they came up with this policy, which again goes against Islamic law, of taking your own subjects and compelling them to convert. So, so we have to um, think about these, both of these together. And over the centuries then, millions, absolutely millions of Christians and to a lesser state um, Jews were um, and converted to Islam. I wanted to come in because what you mentioned, there's a question here which I thought might fit into just this section of the conversation. Uh, one of our members of the audience asks that, did, did the Ottomans ever then actively uh, legalize this sort of tolerance? Was there any laws or legal devices that actually prohibited discrimination or hatred um, or uh, of non-Muslims? Was, was there any mechanism in the 
in their legal system to not allow um, atrocities against the non-Muslims? Well, the, the atrocities um, perpetrated against people in the early centuries of the empire were perpetrated against Muslims, uh, people that we today would call Shi'i Muslims. Uh, there were massacres of Muslims in the 16th century, but there weren't any uh, massacres of Christians or Jews um, uh, in the empire. There were massacres of Armenians began in the 19th century, which, was a, which uh, we could talk about. So the question is about the legal apparatus. The Ottomans incorporated two separate bodies of law and harmonized them. One was Islamic law, Sharia. And Sharia is, is of course, something that's always evolving, always being interpreted anew. And so Ottoman thinkers over the centuries um, used that body of, of Sharia law. At the same time, there was a body of secular law. So these were simply the, the decrees of the Sultan. The Sultan could just declare a law. And many of these, were not in harmony with Islamic law. So the Ottomans then created two figures, two positions. One was a chancellor, and his task was to try to make Islamic law go together or secular law fit Islamic law. And they also created the position of the Sheikh al-Islam, the leading mufti. And his position, his job was to harmonize, again, secular law and Islamic law. So that both were given very difficult tasks. And um, you know, you could, you, we could question um, how legitimate they were in the sense or whether they were just trying to create a body of law that was, that was practical. The Ottomans were also incorporating perhaps the, the, um, their other inheritance, the Mongol inheritance. Of course, the leader of the Mongols, the Khan, was able to, to declare a decree and, and, and make law. So, so they had these bodies of law, um, and, and there are many important scholars today, younger scholars than me, who are working on, on those bodies of law. And, and apropos of that, um, which fits in <clears throat> with, with, with the tolerance paradigm, um, what exactly you've described is perhaps a more extreme case compared to the other Islamic setups, but it's important to realize that for all that there were some movements um, that could be described as, as fundamentalist and Puritan, again, um, bringing an analogy with, with Puritanism here in this country in the um, 17th century. On the whole, there were always several areas of practice in, in the Ottoman Empire, like there had been in previous Islamic polities, which were secular, um, where the Islamic law did not really apply, medicine being a key example of it, of course, that, that um, and famously, um, nothing stopped Muslims and, and the dynasty itself to usually have non-Muslim doctors, partly precisely because of the fact that they didn't want to follow Sharia-based medicine, so to speak. And they were by no means the exception. This was something that, that, that happened both in other Islamic periods and in other places. Um, so um, that is um, uh, something that your book highlights, um, I think, very nicely. And it is um, a tragic irony, um, more of a tragedy than an irony, of course, um, in, in, by any stretch, that it was when the egality um, between the Muslims and the non-Muslims was sort of um, uh, put in, 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 in on paper with, with the decrees of the 19th century, the famous um, perestroika, to give them a bit of a now, uh, 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 um, um, reorganization that is Tanzimat in, 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 in the sort of Islamic term, uh, decrees of the 19th century, which eventually after the Crimean War um, stipulated equality before the law between Muslims and non-Muslims, the vagaries of the Oriental question and, and the great power game on the one hand, um, the great rise of education on the other and the schools as, you, as, as, as your book explains, and the education activities of both the Muslims and the non-Muslims led to an to a boom, not just in education, but a boom of activity amongst the non-Muslims, which was greatly resented. And though there is no linear connection between um, these developments and the pogroms against the Armenians and some of the massacres of Christians um, in different parts of the empire, it still remains a fact that 
the traumatic events of the Balkan Wars um, at the turn, of course, of the 20th century, where um, territories um, were assigned to different countries under the guise of nationalism, which had been abandoned by terrorized civilian populations chased out exactly for the purpose of, of declaring one area to one state, Greece, Serbia, Bulgaria being the three in particular, Romania um, partly as well, though not involved in these massacres, led directly to a chapter that is also an incredibly important a contribution of your book on the Armenian genocide, um, which you both, um, which is in, in many ways the closing um, the, the complete destruction of, of the possible Ottoman dream um, or the Ottoman illusion, grand illusion, if, 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 um, if um, one can put it like that. And um, that, of course, was not the result of, 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 of the Tanzimat equality, but it, it is a chapter that is also very much part of European history, um, especially through its link to... to, to um, um, the definition of the crime of genocide um, by, by, by Lemkin. Um, um, so um, it is, um, I want to give you um, an opportunity to comment on, on, on the way that the, 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 the um, telling of the story of the genocide as you do through this, this dramatic um, um, account of a woman again, and, and, and I think there will be a little bit more about women in a second. Um, um, uh, uh, precisely um, um, exemplifies what um, could go terribly wrong um, in, 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 in this polity. Yeah, from, from 1789 to the end of empire, different groups of uh, people, members of the dynasty, the administration, intellectuals, were trying to figure out how to save the empire in their words. So it was a long mm -hmm. period, a long 19th century, and because they realized that the Ottomans had lost their technological edge and um, by the 18th century, and the empire was beginning to lose territory, of course, and they also were threatened by a new um, enemy, which was Russia. And so Russia began to press upon Ottoman territories through southeastern Europe, but also down the Caucasus and into eastern Anatolia. So from both ends, Russia was pressing. And so the Ottoman states, men and intellectuals thought, well, how can we, how can we make this, uh, how can we save our empire? And there was a group of Ottoman Muslim intellectuals called the, the Young Ottomans. And they believed that through parliament and constitution and Islam together, they could, they could, they could, they could make the empire um, strong and they could save it from, um, from these external enemies. Uh, so their uh, ideas were reflected by the end of the 19th century when the Ottomans did establish their first constitution and their first parliament. By that point, as Yorgos mentioned, they had given up tolerance. By that I mean the medieval concept of, of unequality, where the ruler has subjects who are ranked hierarchically and given different rights and privileges based on where they feel fit in that hierarchy. So by the middle of the 19th century, end of the 19th century, the idea was that every citizen now, no longer subjects, would be equal, whether they were Christian, Jewish, or Muslim. This was happening at the same time as you mentioned, there were, there were nationalisms. The, the Greeks and the Serbs, for example, began to and successfully were able to separate from empire in very, very bloody struggles. We've recently, people are celebrating the 100th anniversary last year of, of Greece, the kingdom of Greece, that was an incredibly bloody, violent revolution in which thousands and thousands of Muslims and Jews were massacred in Greece and in which a kingdom was created for Christians. They meant very exclusively that this was to be a kingdom of Orthodox Christians and Greek speakers too. So this, this went directly against the earlier Ottoman centuries. And so the Ottomans were faced with this new context. And so as we move towards the 19th century, the end of the 19th century, with different nationalisms, with different external threats, again, they try to figure out how could they save the empire. And they tried different things. They tried constitutionalism and parliamentarianism. They tried Ottomanism, having everyone be patriotic, 
and be loyal to the Sultan, no matter who they are. They tried to enroll Christians and Jews in the military, which they did after 1909. All these efforts though, all these efforts, they needed more time to work out. These efforts didn't work out. And what we see again at the end of the 19th century with the rise of Armenian revolutionary parties, political groups, even terrorists, um, besieging banks and so on in Istanbul, we see a very harsh crackdown by the empire under Abdul Hamid II. If we move into the First World War, this is a different regime. This is a different regime. You have uh, a, a party of, of revolutionaries who have overthrown, really, the government, have taken control into their hands from 1913 to 1918, the ruling the empire through more or less martial law. They've restricted all, all rights of the citizens. And it's, in, and it's in this context that they lose the Balkan War. They lose their homeland of Salonika. And you have all these traumatized Muslims who are the victims of Christian massacres moving into the empire, victims of Russia massacring civilians, not just today, but also um, at that time, 1912, 1913. So you also have the, an increase in Ottoman Muslim nationalism, an increase in Turkish nationalism, and you throw all this together in world war. You, you have the Ottomans join the wrong side, the losing side on the world war. You have Ottoman armies commanded by Germans, you have Ottoman soldiers fighting alongside Ottoman soldiers. One of those soldiers, one of those Germans was Rudolf Hoss, who would go on to be the commandant at Auschwitz. He's fighting for the Ottomans in Iraq against the British. So in this, this, this wartime disaster, where the Ottomans are losing in the south to the British, losing in the east to the Russians, losing territory, panicking, holding off at Gallipoli, but worried that Gallipoli will fall, the capital of Istanbul will fall, the dynasty will be extinguished. So in this, in this moment of panic, the, the rulers of the junta, Talat Pasha and the others, pay more attention to conspiracy theories about Armenians than they do to actual military developments. Rather than focusing on the real Arab revolts in the South and the, the Arabs who are allying with the British, they focus on Armenians, and they believe all Armenians, not just the, the revolutionaries, not just the guerrillas, all Armenians, men, women, and children, babies, grandparents, they're all potential or actual traitors, and a decision is made in 1915 to, to annihilate them. Now, I like to say that the, the Armenian genocide is probably the most well-documented event in Ottoman history, and we could write a history of the Armenian genocide just using our Ottoman sources. We could, we could ignore the, the, the eyewitness accounts of, of the victims and of, of uh, uh, allies of the Ottomans. We could, we could just focus on German sources, but forget the German sources too. They were there with the Ottoman soldiers. We can just read the Ottoman material. And when we do so, we, we understand that they sought to annihilate this one component part of the empire. And this really was the end of the Ottomans. This is the end of the Ottoman idea. This is the end of the dynasty and the empire when they turn on their own uh, citizens. This is the end of coexistence um, in the early 20th century. It's not later on when, the, when, when the, the Zionists are doing their thing in Palestine. This is, as, a, as one current book would argue, it's, it's the Zionists who cause the, the end of the age of coexistence. That comes later. The, a, the end of the Ottoman age of coexistence is the Armenian genocide. I, um, Thank you. I lots of wonderful questions are streaming in. I know that I booked my slot to ask you on the occasion of the 8th of March, International Women's, I was going to ask about women, but as usual, women can have to be back of the queue. I need to honor the questions coming from our audience. We have a very interesting comment and then a question uh, the comment is that Sultan Mehmed's Ahname, which brings independence and tolerance to the ones who are from another religion, belief and race, is written by uh, Fatih Sultan Mehmed after the conquest of Bosnia-Herzegovina in May 28, 1463. And the origin uh, of the Ahname is kept as the Franciscan Catholic Church in Fonseca in Bosnia-Herzegovina. 
and the Ah Nome has just very recently been published by the Ministry of Culture in, on the occasion of the 700th anniversary of the foundation of the state of Ottoman. So this is one of our audience thought we ought to note that, but slightly changing the narrative, another audience member says that so far the painted picture uh, of the Ottomans is you know, overwhelmingly positive. But does the book also show how the Ottomans were a colonial force? taking the riches from the Middle Eastern provinces, keeping the population poor, enforcing the uh, horrendous taxes, taking the great artisans from all over the empire, empire, and how they enforce the Hanafi legal system in the Sharia courts, rather than the existing tolerance and choice of having the four madaheb, like Egypt, for example, did. Yes, uh, in response to the first uh, comment, I, I believe they're speaking of, of Bosnia. Is it Bosnia with the ministry, which is, yes, of course. And one of, I also always tell my students, you don't have to go to Turkey to do Ottoman research. You go to Bosnia or where, what I've done, you know, spend time in Greece, or even better would be to go to Bulgaria. Bulgaria has the second most Ottoman language materials in, in, in the world. They're kept in Bulgaria. We could, we could research Ottoman history just looking at these archives and libraries in Southeastern Europe. The other question, was about um, the, the negative aspects of Ottoman rule. In the book, I do have a chapter which talks about Ottoman Orientalism. So I talk about both the Orientalism of the British and the French and the Germans and the Russians and the way they treated the Ottomans. But then I also talk about how some of the Ottoman elite, they took in this, they, they assimilated this, this Orientalism and they turn it against Arabs and Bedouin and uh, Druze and other component peoples of the empire. So as I state in the very beginning of the book, the aim of the book is, is not to praise um, the Ottomans. It's also not to, to simply criticize. Them. It is, uh, it's an honest history of the Ottomans. It, it's based mainly on Ottoman chronicles and uh, you know, leading scholarship from around the world. And the aim is to tell the picture, tell the story of the dynasty and tell it in all its complexity. I've had, I've had readers email me and um, you know they, they don't, they're not too happy that I include uh, different you know, different episodes. But a historian doesn't, you know, a, a true historian doesn't just glorify the past, doesn't also just uh, criticize the past. But but we're trying to understand how the Ottomans were unique, but also similar to us, and all the different aspects of their society and their government. The book has social history, cultural history, diplomatic history for the, the, the military uh, history buffs, there's battle scenes in there. This is, this is a history of the dynasty uh, in all these different dimensions. Today is world, uh, it's International Women's Day. I think Nargis, you had, a, you had a question about that. I wanted to know um, about how, I, I, I love the opening of your book. I love the uh, description of the, you know, you looking at the manuscripts, but rather longing to join the others who seem to have access to manuscripts. You might not have been given immediately. I love that scene. And I have to say the book is so beautifully written. I mean, it is, you know, it, it is very, it's not what one expects at this, you know, dry academic narrative. And that must be a credit to your style of writing. My question was that when, you were looking at this manuscript. What, to what extent the roles and lives of women at court um, is you know, chronicled? Are they the written evidence? And how much was this? Is it just a by the by um, you know, uh, uh, appendix or are they very much uh, discussed as having a you know, central role? Well, I, I do uh, spend a lot of time in the book on gender and sexuality, both for men and women. And that's something that's been missing from a lot of earlier studies and a lot of academic uh, text. A lot of academic scholars don't want to, to to talk about aspects of gender and sexuality that might be controversial today. But again, if we read Ottoman sources, if we read Mehmed II's poetry written under a pen name, but we know it's his poems, and he's devoting his poem and expressing his desire for Christian youth, Christian males, young Christian males. You know, as a historian, didn't we have to write about that? And I, I begin a chapter with, with a quote from his, uh, one of his works. But regarding women, of course, when I was in the archive at Topkapa Palace, 
I was able to realize that I realized that uh, some Ottoman women ruled uh, in in reality. They weren't ruling. They didn't have legitimacy to rule. They couldn't legally rule. It was always a man. Only men could rule. But in practicality, in the especially in the 17th century, when someone like Mehmed the Fourth comes to, is enthroned at the age of seven or eight, actually his mother and even his grandmother are there in the palace. And when I was in the archives, I was realizing that actually this is a young boy. He's not making any decisions, but it's his mother who's actually standing behind a curtain. And when the Sultan is meeting with the Grand Vizier, the prime minister, it's actually the mother speaking from behind a curtain saying, we need to build these two fortresses on the, on the straits. And this is how much money we could give to it. I've looked, you know, this is how much uh, I'm give from my own, my own purse. And, and, the, and, and this is what happened. The, the mother of the Sultan ordering two fortresses to be built. One is still there today. And also uh, who should, you know, hiring people, firing people, all these personnel decisions in the palace. We know the mother is behind the curtain. She's, she's giving orders and through the Sultan, but she's actually the one. So we know that women in the palace are playing a big role in politics, especially in the 16th and 17th century. And it does come out. It does come out in the, even in the archival sources. Fantastic. There, um, there are questions that um, I think you've just touched upon the Ottomans and the, uh, in Lebanon with the Druze. Uh, some, uh, a question about that and also um, relationship between the Kurds and the Ottoman Empire. And I think if I find, if I look up for the, uh, I think it about the Druze was, did the Ottomans align with the Druze because they considered them Muslims in their struggle against Christians and Maronites? Um, what that was, you know, the nuance of that uh, question. And so the Druze, uh, Ottomans, Kurds and Ottomans, and also another question that brings it up to say that, uh, is it correct that parts of um, uh, Ukraine were, um, you know, ruled by the Ottomans? And is this is, is there anything we can trace in the uh, current uh, dynamic of this uh, war? Let's call it what it is, uh, and going back to Russians and the Ottomans over that territory. These are all good questions. So the Ottomans, again, to understand them, we can't just think of them as Muslims going against Christians. We also can't think of the Ottomans so simply as simply being Sunni Muslims. And for example, when they battled the Safavis in Iran, that it's, it's this is simply a Sunni versus Shi'i conflict. It's, it's, not, it's not as simple as that. So, the, so there was a large pocket of Shi'i Muslims in Lebanon. And you would think that the Ottomans wouldn't tolerate that, that this large body of, of Shi'is. But we know from scholars' work, uh, looking at the archives, the Ottoman archives, that actually for, for a century, a century and a half, two centuries, 15th and 16th centuries, at least, even into the 18th century, the Ottomans are employing Shi'is as governors and as administrators and as military leaders in what is today Lebanon. So never mind, what we think might have been a confessional divide between Shi'i and Sunni. The Ottomans were practical. There were these, these several big families in southern Lebanon and, in, and also in Tripoli, another, and also in the Bekal Valley, so three different parts of what is today Lebanon. There were Shi'i families that gained and had full support of the dynasty. Now, the group that suffered more on, in the Ottoman centuries were the group that today calls themselves the Alevi. Uh, in Syria, they're called Alawites. In Turkey, they're called the Alevi. And they trace their roots back to, well, at least the 16th, 15th century to a group that the Ottomans considered to be supporters of the Safavid Shah. And, call, and, and they call them Kuzilbash. This was the name of the fanatic supporters of the Safavid Shah. So there, as I mentioned, uh, when Selim in 1516 is marching east to, to battle the Safavids, um, not in 1560, before that, sorry, in 1501, when he's going east, he has local officials write up lists, draw lists of local Ale uh, Alevi, Alawites. And when his army arrived in those towns, those Alawites, those Alevi were taken out and executed. So, so it's actually, this is the group that has, um, you know, remembers this, and this is five centuries ago. So that's why when 
when the current regime in, in Istanbul built a, a new bridge over the Bosphorus and called it the Sultan Selim Bridge. This is why Alawites, Alevi in Turkey were so outraged because Sultan Selim had, they remember him for massacring their ancestors. The other question was about the Kurds. Of course, the, there were diverse Kurdish groups in the empire. Uh, in the early centuries, uh, there were Kurdish uh, sheikhs and Kurdish princes and notables who sided with the Ottomans. There were, so for example, one of the greatest Ottoman history writers was a, was a Kurd, Kurdish uh, man um, called Bitlisi, and he wrote a great work in Persian, a great history. He sided with the Ottomans and he convinced other Kurdish notables to do as well. But of course, there were other Kurds, Kurdish uh, groups. The, the Kurds were pretty much left alone on the frontier between Safavid Iran um, and the Ottoman Empire pretty much left alone, it was more a question of loyalty. So if they proclaimed their loyalty to the Sultan, then they were left alone. This will all change in the 19th century when we have a centralizing aspect and some Kurdish groups, some Kurdish leaders were, were attacked, wiped out by the Ottoman uh, dynasty and empire. Others sided with the Ottomans and benefited greatly. And there are some, some names or some families that are still important today and they could trace um, their rise back to late Ottoman times. Yorgo, you're mute, muted. In, uh, I was saying as well, I almost lost contact as well with the mute button, that unfortunately Nag has lost contact via her internet. So maybe Mark, I can repose the question from Diana Dark about U Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine and the Ottomans, um, um, whether you see um, any, um, as a historian, any, any relevant um, connection to make. Well, again, uh, the, the regime in Turkey today finds itself, you know, trying to play a delicate balance between Russia and Ukraine. It has relations with both. Uh, the last thing Turkey needs right now because of its economic crisis and political crisis is a war, but they're right there on the Black Sea. It's, it's really quite dangerous. But this is similar in a way to the Ottomans because the Ottomans in Ottoman times, there were Ukrainian, uh, I'm looking for the right word, let's say military leaders who were, who sided with the Ottomans and would go into battle with them against the Russians or against other powers in the, in the region. Just at the same time, there were other Ukrainian, uh, they were called hetmen, these military leaders who, who went against the Ottomans and would side with the Russians or the Bulgarians or what have you. So it's, so it's quite a diverse picture. And the Ottomans had to, again, play a very delicate balancing act of giving those people um, a little bit of what they wanted, but also making sure that they were loyal. As long as they were loyal um, in, in, in providing arms and so on, fighting alongside them against Russia at other times. And this goes back to the 17th century, the, Ottoman, the Ottomans reached the greatest territorial limit, not in the reign of Suleiman in the 16th century, as people like to believe, but actually, again, under that boy Sultan Mehmed IV in, the, in the, the middle of the 17th century. That's when they're moving into southern, you know, very briefly, of course, but into Ukraine, into southern Poland. That um, might be the point at which my ancestors came across Turks for the first time, I don't know, in southern Poland, maybe. Um, but but I, I don't want to draw out any other um, any other connections. But there are scholars. There are some some really really good uh, scholars in Turkey who look very carefully at the 17th century and the chronicles and 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 could give a very detailed um, um, discussion about you know which Ukrainian strongman supported the Ottomans at, at which time. The point, the bigger point, again, is not just see this as Muslims versus Christians but to see the different alliances that link the Ottomans to European history. Thank you. I apologize that I suddenly very uncharacteristically my things because the landline rang and it just drops that. I'm conscious of um, uh, the time uh, galloping away and I wanted, um, I'll, I'll give you an announcement about our um, uh, lecture in two weeks time or event in two weeks time. But before that, can I ask uh, Jorgos John, Dr. Dedes, to give them a vote of 
thanks and to wrap this section of the lecture. And then I'll quickly do the uh, uh, announcement for the next lecture. All I can say is repeat um, my um, admiration for the um, task you have managed to accomplish um, to accomplish with this bookmark, um, um, because it really is um, uh, extremely important to do um, precisely what you've done in terms of arguing for the cause of 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 needing to examine Ottoman history for its in in all its aspects not not supposedly the good ones that that perhaps we have ended up highlighting a bit more um uh than 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 we should have had today as part of of, of europeans history and as part of the history of the changing europe in many ways these days with large muslim populations of course as well and so on from one end to the other end of europe this being the case so um um, um certainly as an institution that has in the past produced Ottoman historians, namely the, the, the last one that, that wrote a book similar to yours, Caroline Finkel, as you said, um, we're all um, very thankful. Thank you for having me um, appear in your seminar. Uh, thank you. So we, we had a, um, a, pri a question was privately addressed to you, Mark, which was about uh, as a lady from, um, if I bring this back, um, whether you are related to the anthropologist Hans Bauer, is that something that, they, because this lady uh, did her master's in University of Arizona with this professor, but she wants to say she found this talk amazingly fascinating. She is from the Chicago area and, you know, has studied German, has studied Ottoman history, and is now very interested in the Turkish diaspora in Germany. So she obviously has quite a few books of yours to read on that aspect. Um, absolutely, it goes without saying how grateful we are that you did squeeze your, uh, uh, your precious time and squeezed into our program. And uh, I have to say, I, I'm loving the book. I thought I can just quickly you know, turn the pages, find something to you know, highlight a few bits to uh, discuss, but I actually found that it's really wonderful. And I'm just taking my time over reading it. And thank you so much as ever to our loyal audience. Our next event, the last event of uh, LM, uh, 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 SOAS Middle East Institute, uh, on Tuesday lectures. We are delighted to say that it's going to be face to face. I don't want to jinx it. It will be at the Brunei Gallery Lecture Theatre on 22nd of March, starting at 6 p.m. And it is a, a book launch, an amazing book launch. And how lucky is it that Dr. Dedes is here because it's on a, a, a entitled Faces of the Infinite and uh, uh, Neoplatonism and Poetry at the Confluence of Africa, Asia, and Europe, a book co-edited by Professor Stefan Spurl and Dr. Jorgos Dede. So you'll find more information about that on our webpage. And um, I hope as many of you who are in London or a good you know, um, commutable distance from London will join us. The details for registration are there. But thank you so much, Jorgos, and thank you so much, Mark, Professor Barr, for this amazing evening. Really grateful for your times. And enjoy your love, your time in the lovely literary festivals in India and you know, going to Jaipur and then Lahore. We try not to be very jealous. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.